Zelda fans go hard. Some of the most popular and well-watched gaming videos on YouTube are about Zelda. The Zelda content creator community is one of the most prolific gaming communities on the internet. Zelda fans are quick to embrace new creators who show love and dedication to the series, and the support that these fans show in the comments is second to none. At the same time, one could say that Zelda has a notoriously opinionated and strident fan base. Some have described the Zelda fandom as the worst in gaming, as in the least tolerant of dissenting opinions and perspectives. If you spend any time consuming Zelda commentary, you'll quickly find flash wars spanning every aspect of the series with factions taking decisive sides. Does the lore matter? Should dungeons come back? Is there a timeline? Is the series dead? Is Breath of the Wild a Zelda game? Is Tears of the Kingdom DLC? I noticed a significant split in the fanbase in the months leading up to Tears of the Kingdom's release. Hype levels were historically high, and concerns of less hyped fans were frequently dismissed or openly mocked. Even back in Breath of the Wild's release window, dissenters were ostracized. But truthfully, the toxicity of the Zelda fanbase has been a subject of discussion for many years. Now you may be thinking, well, every fanbase is like this, but I disagree. Zelda fans do seem more protective than other fandoms I engage with, and I want to talk about it. Why are Zelda fans so passionate, committed, and protective of their views and perspectives on the series? What is it about Zelda that leads to so much fandom tension? I've seen several answers to these questions that basically boil down to Zelda fans just suck. I disagree with this. I don't think the Zelda series just attracts crappy fans. I think that fan bases tend to reflect the media that they are organized around. Therefore, I think that the answers to our questions lie in the game series itself. So without further ado, let's try to find out what exactly it is about Zelda that makes its fans go so very hard. Let's start with what Zelda fans do have in common with other fandoms. The research that exists on fandom, much of which is centered around sports, primarily suggests that our participation in fandoms is fueled by our desire for social identity the aspect of our identity that is focused on what we have in common with other people. By participating in a fandom, we are joining a social group, and this feels good. If we look at fandoms through the lens of social identity theory, we can see how members of a fandom would be motivated to police negative opinions about whatever the fandom is centered around. The bedrock foundation of the group is the media or sports team or public figure that brought the community together in the first place. Using Zelda as an example, critiquing an aspect of the series isn't merely expressing an opinion. It is a very real threat to the social cohesion of the group. If the game our group is built around actually sucks, then the group is obsolete. This feels bad, and for this reason, dissenting opinions are quickly targeted and pushed out. We see this dynamic in virtually every fandom ever, and Zelda is no exception. I found it interesting how many Zelda channels went relatively quiet after Tears of the Kingdom's release. And in the past couple of months, I've seen more and more of them come out and express their dislike of the game. What intrigues me the most about this wave of critical content is how it appeared to snowball. Once a couple of influential creators came forward with their critiques, other creators seemed more comfortable doing so. One potential explanation for this is that these creators were afraid of losing their in-group status. They didn't want to risk ostracization from a social group that they get meaning, and in some instances, their livelihoods from. Once well-loved members of the group demonstrated that they could critique the game without being shunned, others felt more secure doing so. Social identity is part of the story, but it's not unique to Zelda at all. It's a fairly universal thing in fan communities. But there are certain aspects of the Zelda series that shape the fandom in interesting ways. And to understand this better, we need to talk about experience taking. Experience taking is the process of taking on traits, attitudes, or behaviors of our favorite fictional characters. This is different from perspective taking. When we take on a character's perspective, we are empathizing with their position. This process takes conscious effort, and we are always aware that their perspective is not our own. 
Experience taking, on the other hand, is the unconscious process of losing ourselves in a character. We aren't just seeing things from their point of view, we are actually merging their identity with our own. Researchers say that experience taking can only happen if we can forget about ourselves while engaging with the story. The more we are forced to confront our own self-concept, the more difficult it is to take on a character's experience. One study found that readers had a much harder time taking on the experience of a literary character if they read in front of a mirror. It's not as easy to get lost in a story when we are tethered to an image of ourselves in a mirror. When we play a Zelda game, we aren't simply taking on Link's perspective, we are living it. And there are aspects of Link's characterization that help facilitate this, like his intentional androgyny. We don't have to identify as male to incorporate the character of Link into ourself. In general, video games facilitate more experience taking than perspective taking, as you are literally playing through the character's experience. But silent protagonists like Link really amplify this. If he had a voice or a tone or an attitude that sounded nothing like ours, that would force us to confront our self-concept and jar us out of the experience. Link's characterization leaves just enough gaps for us to fill with our own identities. In Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, the story cuts more towards perspective taking due to the method of telling the narrative through memories. I have seen many fans bemoaning the return of the memory cutscenes, and I think this is the reason why. They take us out of the experience by merely asking us to view a perspective. This disrupts the experience taking process and therefore our immersion and enjoyment of the story. If we do not like or feel motivated to do what the game tells us Link is supposed to do, it impedes our enjoyment of the game. One of the reasons Majora's Mask hits so hard emotionally is that it compels the player to do exactly what Link is doing. Our motivations and Link's actions merge over the course of the game. We want to save the world, and Link is saving the world. I felt like Breath of the Wild's memories gave me compelling reasons to save the world. But by the time I got to play as Link, the ship had sailed. By the time I got to connect with the champions narratively, they'd already been dead for a hundred years. There's a misalignment there, I think, and it breaks the immersion for me. Experience taking might give us the best explanation as to the infighting in the Zelda fandom. If we're all unconsciously merging ourself with Link, then when we disagree with another fan's opinion, we aren't just evaluating and rejecting their perspective, we are rejecting their self-concept, which feels much more threatening. They then feel the need to defend not just their opinion, but themselves. This is something that happens unconsciously on both sides. And in this way, I think Zelda may always have a fiercely protective fan base, as experience taking is a potent phenomenon in the Zelda series. It's an organic byproduct of Link's avatar, the result of developer decisions made over several decades. Speaking of the development team, there are idiosyncrasies in Zelda's development process that stoke the flames of division in the fandom. I think one of the best and worst things about Zelda is how it tries to offer something to everyone. You really aren't required, or maybe even expected, to have existing knowledge of the series in order to hop in on any given Zelda game. This is great because it keeps the door open to new fans. It can also be frustrating for returning fans because it can come off as either patronizing, in the case of Skyward Sword, or narratively confusing, in the case of Tears of the Kingdom. But I also suspect that this design approach is what allows the Zelda team to innovate and experiment in ways they'd maybe be reluctant to if they were always catering to returning fans. This is one of the strengths and one of the liabilities of the Zelda series. With the exception of the direct sequels, fans can really never know what to expect from these games. So much changes from game to game. Even things that are assumed to be mainstays of the series, like dungeons, or even Zelda herself, can be left in the dust with a new release. Besides the presence of Link, and usually of Zelda, these games look, feel, and play like nothing else before or after them. And since we don't know what to expect, we tend to hype things up. We want each new game to be as good as that one or those ones we loved before, and we have so much time between releases to grow the hype monster. 
If you want to get deep about it, and by this point I assume you do, you might say that Zelda fans are anxiously attached. Because we so rarely get a hit from Zelda, and have very little idea of what to expect, we become hyper fixated on how the game might make us feel. And because this bond is so tenuous and provisional with each release, we get very defensive of it. Likewise, when we are disappointed by Zelda, when this bond is damaged in some way, we feel abandoned and take to the forums and the comments sections to look for validation. Obviously, attachment theory is not designed to be used in the context of video games. I'm just trying to facilitate understanding. Nor do I think this is any result of malicious intent on the part of the developers. I don't think they're trying to play with our emotions. I just think this is what happens when you start from scratch with each new release. And finally, the Zelda devs just can't seem to help themselves from inserting controversial elements into their games. Name a Zelda title, and I'll name a feature that is still a thorn in some part of the fandom's side. Weapon durability, motion control, stealth missions, stealth missions, and stealth missions. Too few dungeons, too many dungeons, no dungeons, transformations, cell shading, and on and on. When you're constantly experimenting and innovating and reworking, you're going to inevitably create divisions among your fan base, as some fans will embrace your new ideas and others will reject them passionately. I don't really have a psychological analysis to offer here, just empathy for all sides of the fandom. It's hard being a Zelda fan, you know? And really, that's the main takeaway here. While Zelda shares commonalities with other fandoms, there are aspects of this series that make its fans especially passionate and protective. And as I've discussed here, most of these things are happening beneath our conscious awareness. I'm not going to tell you to be nice because I'm not your mom. But maybe the next time a Zelda fan gets on your nerves, keep in mind that, because of the strange psychological storm that is Zelda, they may just be feeling a little vulnerable. Play them the Song of Healing on your mental ocarina and keep questing. <laughs>